Hi, every... Oh, my God. Every time. Every single time. How are you guys? Good? Excellent. Thank you so much for being here with us today. My name is Jarrett Weisselman. I'm a senior editor for BuzzFeed, and very excited to talk about the show you guys just watched, Marry Me with the cast. So, first up, ladies and gentlemen, give a big round of applause for Ken Marino. Uh, next up, Sarah Wright Olson. <laughs> then we have John Gemberling. <laughs> Thank you. Timberly Hill. Oh, yeah. Emmy winner, Dan Bukatinsky. Yeah. You didn't bring the Emmy? No, it's in the car. It's in the car. Can you get it? I'll go get it. And last but not least, Casey Wilson. Here she is. Here she is. <laughs> Hello. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here today. Uh, congratulations on the show, super funny. A couple of you were in here uh, watching the episode. Is it strange to actually watch the episode with a room full of strangers laughing at it and sort of who you know are not being paid to laugh at it? Like not if they were laughing. <laughs> <laughs> All good, I love it. Um, you know, we're actually gonna start with a question from the audience, because I think this is an interesting uh, question that I've never gotten to ask a panel before. How did you get your SAG card? Uh, Ken, I wanna start with you. I don't remember. <laughs> this was a poor decision on my part. <laughs> start, start, I'll try to think. Ask somebody else. I'm trying to remember. Somebody yeah, one, I know. Yeah. Um, I did him. <laughs> no, I, I definitely <laughs> remember. Because <laughs> I did a few commercials. I did a Myers grocery store commercial. And I did a um, Ben Sherman shirts commercial. And then I was SAG eligible when I got a, my first job on like a t TV show. And so... I went and got my card. It was very exciting. <laughs> I, yeah, I did a commercial for Subway Sandwiches where I was the pizza guy <laughs> that the Subway spokesperson like pushes out of the way and is like, you don't want this garbage, you want Subway Sandwiches. <laughs> Anyone else? Mine's not nearly that exciting. I, um, I got a job. And then I got Taft Heart lead. And then that's the, that, that, that is how it happened. What was the job? What was it? Numbers. Numbers. I was an FBI agent. Yes, numbers. Nice. I'm not a member. <laughs> no, back in my day, which was a long, long time ago, there was these things called SAG Industrials. And they were these sort of training films for companies, but they would use... This is a long story, by the way. No, no, I'll be done, I'll be done in two seconds. Everybody settle in. Settle in. This is a good one. It was a cold day in October. Here we go. We were in a warehouse in New Jersey. Anyway, okay. I'm, it was an industrial. Um, I, I actually, I think I got it on my first movie, which was For Your Consideration. Yeah. Okay, that's, yeah. That's how they, ra they raced me out of my story, so you could hear that. <laughs> but really. my first job, just to take it down a notch, was not through SAG. It was a print campaign for Zellnorm Bloated Stomach Campaign. <laughs> and Christopher Guest saw my work in that. And you never know what job will lead. It's a good lesson. It's yeah. a good, it's a good yeah. lesson. Yeah. All right. Um, Ken, last opportunity. I still don't remember. Perfect. It's fine. If at any point during this it comes to you, just let me know. Um, Casey, I, I, <laughs> Casey um, I would love to sort of uh, go back to sort of the beginning with Marry Me. Obviously, you, I would imagine, were sort of one of the first people involved, given the fact you are married to the creator of the show. Actually, she was the last person cast. Oh, that's yeah. so yeah, rude. I cast everybody and then... <laughs> when and then do you first remember this idea sort of coming up? 
Um, I think, you know, happy endings have been canceled and... <laughs> still mad, still mad. Yeah. <laughs> and David was very upset and kind of in a, a darkness and then immediately was like, and now they're making me come up with something else. So it came out of a really beautiful, healthy, creative <laughs> place. Um, <laughs> saying I have to work for the man and... And we, we were about to get engaged, and although I didn't know this, and he kind of had the idea based around that, uh, I guess that concept of us getting engaged. And so, and then his first thought after writing it was we have to get Ken in this, and then of course everyone else. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty amazing, I think, uh, with the exception, sorry, to, of Dan, you have all worked together in some capacity, whether it's Hot Wives or on Happy Endings before. I mean, coming into a situation like that, is there an instant sort of camaraderie when you all know each other and you're all sort of in the, you know, in the bunker together? You would think, but no, nothing's happening. Nothing's happening. You, you never hope know. for that. You hope for that. You hope for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, so did any someone, was there any need to chemistry test at that point or was sort of given your previous works, you kind of knew you all gelled? May I, uh... We didn't know if we were gonna all gel. We had to just try it like everyone else. No, I'm just kidding. No, seriously, I think we did. I, it, it definitely helped me because one of the things that makes it easier for me to have a good time and to do well is if I feel comfortable and that has everything to do with the people I'm around and the fact that I'd been around all of these people, not just been around them, but already played with them before, hung out with them. It made it super easy. That's a big part of starting for me is acclimating to the people because if I don't feel comfortable, I won't do stuff, I won't try things because I think I'll look like an idiot. And I have known Timberly Chanel Hill for 10 plus years, off. dating back to a game night in Burbank <laughs> that she threw. <laughs> and we became friends since there and I just had to share that. <laughs> I'm glad. What, what, what was the game? I'm just curious. It was a bunch of games. I don't mess around. It was a game night. <laughs> and it was it was at her boyfriend's house, and I knew her boyfriend, who was a soap, soap we star. We didn't have to bring that up. We didn't have to bring it up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then, but we were all so drawn to Timberly. I've never seen that guy again. It was like a dear friend. <laughs> and <laughs> only friends with Timberly. We broke up and they upgraded. I mean, <laughs> come on. Dan, what was it like coming into this group, you know, sort of being the one who had not played with them before? Like being the one who's never played with them before. <laughs> they were very cold, very withholding. It was like, who's this guy? Who does he think he is? There's a lot of that. Well, to be fair, you came in with your belt buckle was your Emmy. And we thought that that was a little presumptuous, you know what I mean? Well, you got to bring with you what you've got. And that's all I had. Yeah, I suppose. I, um, I, was, I got the job on the pilot the day before they started shooting. I must have been the first thought. Yeah, he was the first choice. First choice. <laughs> they had gone th to every actor in L.A. Dean Kane. Dean Kane. I know the names of most of the people they went to, including women and some farm animals. And nobody would take this part. So, but I had literally that week was being murdered on a different show and was sort of in a dark space. You were desperate. And they, and they called me and I was like, I don't care who's in it. I don't know what it is. I don't know. No, that's not true. I had read the pilot for this back in January and laughed my ass ass off. David wrote, it's such a great pilot. It's such a great, he's so talented. I'm not just blowing smoke up your husband's ass, by the way. It was so funny. I was like, God, I really admire this. And, and then I forgot about it. I completely forgot about it. And then it was like two, three months later and I got a call like, do you want to play with Kevin too on, on Marry Me? And I was like, oh, that's such a funny show. And it was a really dark week. And I was like really excited to just join these people and laugh my ass off, which I did. And Ken and I had known each other. We were in an acting class together a couple of years ago. Yeah, 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 years ago. What class? Along, I'm not gonna mention the class. Should we mention the class? <laughs> No, it was Leslie Kahn, who's a great acting teacher. And years and years and years ago, she was my acting teacher, and Ken was in the class we met then. And, but I hadn't really seen you since then. No. I mean, anyway. I've seen you a number of times, but I just kind of... I just had away. other things to do, so I didn't say hi. Right. So there was a lot of that energy when I joined. But anyway, um, it was a great week, a lot of fun. I was happy, and I feel very what, grateful. What was incredible is, like, it was... 
the week where the your episode where you get killed was coming out like and 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 it hadn't happened yet yeah. and it was such a it was such a interesting time to kind of be talking to you and you're like yeah because you weren't allowed to say anything about what was going to happen no in fact i think it aired it aired while we were shooting while yes, we were shooting yes, it aired while we were shooting thursday. so yes. that that thursday i met him i was i am uh, was a huge fan of that show <laughs> um was. And so was and then my Janes died, and then the next morning, Dan walked into the trailer, and I was like, to me. She was like, never again. I'm never watching the show ever again. It was awkward not mentioning what happens on the show to anybody on the show, because I don't think I did no. mention it. Mm -mm. And then and it happened I asked. I, shooting. I didn't want to ruin it. <laughs> anyway, I feel very lucky. I love Stop talking. <laughs> no. um, Ken, I'm curious, you know, Casey said that uh, when they were thinking of the show, they were like, and we have to get Ken. What was it about the show and these people and this character that made you want to get involved? Well, I mean, uh, several things. One, uh, I had worked with uh, Casey and David on Happy Endings. I did a guest spot on that, and we went on a date in the, on the show, and I love Casey, and I, thought, I think David is just a super funny guy, super, uh, a very talented writer, but also just a great human being. Like, he's just a good guy and somebody you want to work for and do a show for and kind of, you know, um, create things with. And uh, and then when I read the script, the first scene, I don't know if anybody's seen the pilot or, you know, the, the first scene of that pilot is so funny and awkward and uncomfortable and perfect and has a great punchline at the end and really establishes the tone and the characters in so quickly. And in pilots, the one tough thing about pilots is it usually takes like half of the pilot to kind of establish what the show is about and who the characters are, and that's always the problem with pilots. And this pilot, within the, by, the, by the end of the cold open, already established what the show was and the tone of it and who the people were in, in such a clear, funny way. I, that, and so I was like, I want in on that as quickly as possible. I think something you see often with comedy on television when sort of the central element of a show as a couple is that everyone else feels like a supporting character, whereas on Marry Me, I kind of feel like this is a very strong ensemble and you don't really get the sense that, you know, it's about these two people and they're friends, like it's a group of friends. Um, when you guys read the script and you saw these roles, did you get that sense from there or was it conversations with David and he said, you won't just be coming in, delivering a funny line and leaving? I definitely felt like from the beginning that I could see who my character was and what was going to happen and I was excited to be a part of it. I mean, I feel the same way. It was just, you know, when I read it, I was like, oh my God, what, what do I have to do to be able to be a part of this? And she slept with my husband. I did. <laughs> Basically, that's what I Code for she slept with Casper. He's a very beautiful man. It was easy. Uh, yeah, I mean... Reading the script... I didn't find it that easy. <laughs> I just didn't. I, I love him, but that's I... That's fair, that's fair. <laughs> um, reading the script, like, especially knowing that it was, you know, coming off of happy endings, it definitely felt like an ensemble thing. At a certain point in the lead-up promotional process, they were like, push the idea that it's an ensemble, it's not just a couple thing, and it felt like that's not really necessary. It's pretty clear that it's, you know an ensemble with, you know, an accent on the two main people. Why do you raise your, why are you raising your eyebrows? Huh? I, mean, I was that in quotes. That you raised your eyebrows. Just I was that in quotes. Yeah, well, why did you put you know, that in quotes? It's an ensemble that has a couple of main, you know. No, but, they, but when you say that, it, you, it's, it's, and, it's and there's also It's a predominantly kind of like an ensemble, the and then there's a couple kind of, of like, you know, touched angel people that float a little bit. Yeah, oh, yeah, okay, yeah. good, better, good, better, 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 Roma better. Downey's on the show? That's amazing. <laughs> Precious angels. <laughs> Dilly, what was the audition process like for you? I mean, was there even an audition process given everyone's pre-existing relationships? Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it went on. Um, but it was great, and I'll tell you why. Because... Um, I went on the first audition, went back for the callback, go in for the first test, go back for the second test. But when I left the second test, I was on my way to Palm Springs to go to Casey's bachelorette party weekend. So I was literally like, can we get into this? Because there are a bunch of women drinking by a spa waiting and for And I was me. drunk in the pool, like, please let her get this part. <laughs> yes. 
and the can't whole go through time, this. <laughs> I could not wait to leave. But then I thought, and then I was also, but then I found out as I was putting my suitcase into my car to drive off, I got a call from my manager saying that I booked it. So I was screaming at Casey on the phone while I was driving to her bridal weekend. It was great. <laughs> Could have taken a dark turn had things not I gone know. that well. Can you imagine? It's been a dark, dark weekend. I, I think they would have not told me till Monday. <laughs> David knew I was on my way. Yeah. So you also sort of implied that it for you is a long process as well. Do you enjoy the audition process? No. <laughs> <laughs> Who does? It's horrible. <laughs> It's terrifying. I mean, still to this day, as many tests as I've done, I walk in the room and I'm like shaking. Um, but you know, it was, I was so excited to do the material that when I walked in, it was like that stuff went away and I just wanted to do a great job. But I did, we did walk in. I did the same testing process that Timberly did. And when I walked in, there was a guy there and it was me and Timberly and like a whole bunch of other I never have spoken to David about that. <laughs> and then there was this guy, and we were like, there's two women roles. Like, who's this guy going up for? And then he was going in for her part. And I was like, you're going in against a dude? That is so random. I didn't just have to fight down all of the bitches in this city. I had to beat the men down, too. It's true. I mean, we were, we were both, she came out and she was like, whatever. <laughs> I was like, I know. I, and I never, I mean, I'm a complete idiot. I don't, I just sort of wander through my life. I don't pay a much attention. So when I saw him, I just assumed he was up for something else. I'm hanging out with him. We sat and we talked, we shot the shit. I thought I was making friends. And then I was like, so what, 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 what are you up for? And he was like, it's so really weird. I'm reading for Kay. And I was like, that is really weird. Whereas it was the first question I asked when I walked in, who's the dude here for? And they were like, Kay, and I was like, thank God. Okay, <laughs> you go. I think that's such an interesting thing though about the development process of a television show where literally like genders of roles can be switched. Yeah. I mean, was it simply, I mean, Casey, from your perspective at the time, was it simply just trying to figure out what would be the best permutation for the show or did like that guy know someone and you're just doing him a favor? <laughs> to be honest, I'm not sure. I think like, cause Timberly came in really late in the process for Kay, I, th I think, right? I'm not really sure. I think it was just kind of like, what's gonna be the best kind of ensemble. But I think once she came in, I know it was very clear it was her. And I think it was about like, I guess let's see one other type. But I think, cause also the character in the pilot was so crazy that maybe they thought, and I don't, this is probably wrong or right to say, but like, could, it was it too crazy for a woman with dignity to play? Like I. <laughs> <laughs> Like she peed on herself. And then when Timberly came in, they're like, oh no, that'll hang quite nicely <laughs> on her. But I, I do, you know, I think that opening scene in the pilot really does sort of set the world up. Uh, what was that? I mean, that first monologue is really amazing that you get to have where you sort of like lose your mind in the kitchen. Um, what, did, what did sort of when you were conceptualizing the character, what were the things you were sort of hanging your hat on about who she was? Well, I, I was a little worried not about you know trying to be so likable, but I was kind of trying to keep my eye on that this is the first thing you're seeing of a character and I don't want to be so alienating and so unlikable that people just turn it off because I think she's overall a likable character, but this is the moment that she freaks out. So, but I also sort of empathize with her, honestly, because I think she'd been dating this guy for six years and gone on two Mexican vacations <laughs> and come back with no ring. <laughs> and I've, I've had those moments in my life where, you know, it's just that moment that you see, it's not flattering and it's, it's not, not pretty or cute at all. And so I, I was just trying to try to balance it with humor, but also that there is that emotion there of you feel just so enraged and only to, you know, be really embarrassed when, you know, she finds out he's, spoiler alert, <laughs> all his friends and family are hiding in the house and they've all witnessed this <laughs> meltdown. So, but I, yeah, I worked on it, you know, strangely also with Leslie Kahn a bit to bring it all full circle. All full circle. Yeah. Um, you know, and I do have to say as a fan of yours, I felt it was extremely appropriate that you, your character, have gay parents because it feels like the most natural thing in the entire world. It does. I, 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 we, I kind of, we got the idea a little bit, and I only say we, I did nothing to do with the writing of this, but I did an Actors Theater of Louisville, an apprenticeship program many years ago, and there were these guys in Louisville, Les and Larry, who were kind of charged with 
taking care of the apprentices and we would go over to their house and they had a hot tub and they were like the best guys in the world and I had so much fun with them and I loved the relationship I had with them so much and I always was talking about them and David's like, it's almost like you wish Les and Larry were your parents and I said, I 100% do. I wish I grew up with Les and Larry. And so that was sort of the idea for the Kevins and I, I think it's a natural, and I have two friends, two dear friends, Kevin and Kevin married to each other and just had to throw that in for good measure. <laughs> Um, whose idea was to have both Kevins be 35? <laughs> that was like, you know. I love it, by Network the way. television is so strange. I mean, I feel like I'm fielding questions that I didn't really, wasn't in on, but they would bring up people for the dads, uh, you know, that are age appropriate for me, and they're like, no, no. They're like, can we get Christopher Mintz Plotz <laughs> to play her father? <laughs> it was just like, <laughs> so crazy. And Tim and Dan are my peers. <laughs> But it Not feels really. like theater, really. but it feels like theater school where you're like I was playing like an old lady and everybody's just like putting on Ben Nye makeup and it's just like, <laughs> it's very strange. No, we're having fun. It's really fun and Tim... It doesn't sound like it. Listen, it's fun and, and everyone, a few people mention it, but I think you forget about it after a while. You put a little gray in the hair, we're good to go. And, um, and also, we also have, I did bring it up. And you've stopped your treatments. I stopped the treatments. <laughs> All my youth treatments. I actually am 65 in real life, so it's actually dead on. I mean, it's not like, Dan, you did not have like a crazy full producer plate coming into the season. I mean, the comeback was coming back, and thank you for that also. Yes. Uh, yes. You have, you know, web therapy, you have a lot of other things. I mean, what do you, as an artist, get from doing acting in addition to producing and being involved in more behind-the-scenes capacities? Um, it's... Well, it's my first love. It's what I came out to L.A. to do over 20 years ago. Um, I have always w wanted to be an actor, and I spent many, many years writing as a means to act, producing as a means to act. I, you know, I took, my career took a lot of turns away from the light or away from the thing that I really love to do. And it was only because of the recent opportunity that I had on a different show that sort of... Are we not of, allowed to say scandal? <laughs> I'm trying not to promote it. You have to give Shonda Rhimes $15 every time it. you say scandal. I promoted it plenty. I promoted that show plenty for three years. <laughs> and what did I get for it? <laughs> Two Shut. bullets in the back. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm joking. I am extremely indebted to scandal. The short answer is I loved getting to act again. I had an amazing opportunity on that show, and it reawakened in me a love for it, as well as attention to me for it, mm -hmm. and I felt like I really wanted to ride the wave and do other things, and this was a, this was a great way to just keep it, the momentum going in a very different kind of show. And I also love comedy, and these guys are the funniest people I have ever met. <laughs> so it was a great opportunity. I mean, Ken, the same could be said for you. I mean, you've written some of my favorite movies and co-written some of my favorite things. I mean, thanks. You're welcome. Uh, what was it, you know, about sort of being able to manage those two things? What do you feel you as a performer get from being a writer and vice versa? I mean, I mean, you know, I, 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 I write things and I act in things and I try to do as many things as possible out of necessity as just to pay, pay the bills. I mean, and, and in, all, in all honesty. And so... Um, and I, I've always felt that, you know, if it, just, just acting is a very hard thing to do in this town because you, you're constantly waiting for somebody else to give you validation and you're waiting for, like, somebody to say yes to you. And that's a hard thing to kind of do, you know, day in and day out, week in and week out. And so I, I've always been of the mindset of create your own thing and put yourself, create something for yourself. And so how do you do that? Well, you write or you direct it or you produce something. And then in doing that, you can create a character for yourself or you can create a, a world where you can act and do things. And so that's, so, so it's all rewarding for me. I love acting. I, I think acting is, I mean, acting is what I've wanted to do since I was in third grade. And I've been lucky enough to do that fairly consistently. But the reason I've been able to do that is because I've written and produced things and directed things here and there. You know? Absolutely. Um, when we asked the audience for a question, one of the questions that came up the most was how much improv is in the show? I mean, part of me wonders how much improv is in the show, but then the other part of me thinks, 
is that just indicative of having a great camaraderie between the actors that the scripted lines feel, you know, improv? I think there's, uh, you know, we, I, we improvise a lot when we're shooting. I, most of it does not make it into the show. I would say the final <laughs> shows is, is uh, uh, mostly from the script, obviously, but we do do, I think, a pretty good amount of improv. And that's David and the writers being totally not precious about, I mean, they're so open to, you have an idea, yeah, change it, let's have fun, see where this goes. I mean, we, I don't know did it, if anybody saw the, uh, <laughs> The, uh, the episode where we're all stuck in a storage unit. I mean, the shit bucket thing, we went on for, we went on, we went on like an eight minute take about like, where are we gonna eat shit? Whose shit are we gonna have to eat? And you know none of that's gonna make it into the show. <laughs> I mean, but then it did. But then, did. But then her did. thing was bleeped out, which is like, yeah. I don't, what, what was the what would, what did the line wind up being that, that made it in? It was like. Is there a chance we're gonna have to? Yeah, is there a that? chance? Because he had three buckets out: the the <laughs> the, the, kitchen. the kitchen, the 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 bathroom bucket, and then the one puke the puke bucket. And don't mix them up. Is what he gets. So, so so she just at one point, uh, Casey was like, "Is there a chance we're gonna have to eat our own shit?" <laughs> and they used it. They bleeped it out. <laughs> but I mean, the, the 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 to follow up on what you're saying, I think that David David's. I, one of his mantras is like best joke wins. And so like when you go in and you do, they write such funny scripts and they're really tight and we do that stuff and then we'll throw in stuff and David, David is very meticulous about that. He sits through and he, he sits in the editing room and goes through everything and he just whatever, you know, like if, if he finds something that he likes that wasn't in the script, he'll put it in. And so he encourages us to kind of be open and free and go where we want to go as, as long as we also kind of get what's in the script because they work very hard on it and it's very funny. Indeed, I don't think I will ever hear Shoop the same way again now that we've had soup brought oh into our Oh my gosh. Lives. I mean, I don't know if you guys caught because it was the tag at the end of the episode, but oh there was my like a gosh. whole thing when he was lot, like he would not leave the place where you could just eat for free. It's the funniest thing I have ever seen. The woman that they cast, all, all of the, I mean, John, you can speak to it, but all of the Shoop, Shoop dancers <laughs> and singers Oh, I, we're the most phenomenal group of people I've ever seen. Can somebody describe exactly what the end of that scene was? So John. anybody who hasn't seen it, yes. what we're talking about is... It's, it's an all-you-can-eat buffet, and so there's, you know, bottomless, you know, uh, vats of soup. And then it's, it's 24 hours also, so sometime in the middle of the night, they change out the soup. Right, the changing buckets. of the soup. There's a so, moment and there's, it's a big ceremonial thing, right? Yeah, that, that's talked about in the, the middle of the episode. Of the soups and they are required by the restaurant to sing soup, soup, uh, doop, soup, uh, doop, uh, doop, uh, doop, while they change the soup. But they are so lifeless, yeah. <laughs> these people. It's like they're in, you know, a camp or so. It's and then horrible. This very white computer nerd guy has to rap for a moment. <laughs> And it's supposed to take place at like four or five in the morning, but we really did shoot it at like four in the morning. Yeah. Um, so then. <laughs> <laughs> well, working off sort of the idea of improvisation, this is for anybody who would like to take it. We have a question from Angelina who says, how do you bring your authentic self when there are line rewrites in the middle of a scene? And how do you sort of maintain that consistency in the face of sp such spontaneity? Good question. Oh, I mean, I, I kind of can speak to it with respect to the fact that I don't have an improv background. And so it was intimidating for me to step in because when somebody, people just start talking, you're like, mm -hmm. I don't, I don't, I don't have jokes that just come to me. I don't, they don't, uh, it doesn't happen. Uh, no, I don't. And then I, and so I get, I, so there, I don't get as much, um, improv, I don't do as much uh, improv. So I really appreciate um, that it's written well. And I also appreciate as a person who doesn't have, yeah, I'm talking to you. Uh, <laughs> appreciate as a person who um, doesn't have that background. I like it when they come running in with something because it gives me an opportunity to do a fresh thing because they have told me what it is. I don't have to make it up myself. So please come and like shout anything at me because I like that and it makes me look funny. It looks like, you know, it makes it look like you have 
but you don't. Well, I don't. They do. I don't. I think, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure quite what it means to maintain your authentic self, but... Uh, <laughs> I think they mean be true to your work. Right. I mean, I, usually there's like an intention in the scene, like you're, you know, disappointed about something or arguing about something that, that remains the same even if the line changes. And, and usually the line changes are better, I think, you know, funnier or, 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 or clarify something better. But I think it's also sometimes easier to be authentic when you are doing improv because it's, 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 that's the nature of it. It's just literally happening right then. So there's really no way to not be authentic when whatever's coming out of your mouth, you're not even sure <laughs> of. But that's why I think, I think what's nice about improv, even if it's not used, is what it creates is, I think, a spirit, that it, a freshness. And so it, there's just something when you watch it, you feel like it's really happening, even if you're kind of just using the moment that's leading up to something that's not used, there's something in the air that feels very fresh and true to mm -hmm. who everyone is. And it also challenges you, and it makes you feel, you know, a little bit more um, like you're, you know, giving something fresh and new to what you maybe have been working on all week or whatever, and then you throw something in, and you're like, okay, you know, you're pushing yourself to do a little bit more. The other thing I've noticed on the show is that, and this is probably true, true of every show, but the more you do that, the more experience they have of you sort of being yourself in the character, even in improv. As the episodes go on and on and on, I know for me, I, there's a lot of the real me that they have now started to insert into Kevin, this Kevin's mouth, and Tim Meadows also. We're both you know, at the beginning we were a little, and not anyone's fault, but we were like salt and pepper shakers. We were like the two gay dads. You probably, you, we, we oftentimes interchanged our lines. It was like, they're both gay. You can give either one of them either line. It doesn't matter. <laughs> one's black, one's white, but you know. And the truth is, as time emerged, our real personalities came out a little bit, and they, they, we really are extremely different characters. And I think everybody is becoming much more themselves or a little bit of themselves in their characters as we go on. I think that's what I think that's true with any show that goes on. That's why like when shows get canceled so quickly, you're like, oh man, like they, you always hear people say, oh, but the show's just started getting better and better. And the reason it, that is, is because the reason for that is, is that, that the writers are watching the actors and seeing like what their strengths are and what they can, how they can write towards them. And that takes time. It's not, you know, it's not usually something that happens like right out of the gate. And so as shows get more mature and grow, you know, everybody's, everybody's growing and it's becoming like a more organic kind of, uh, you know, show. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, working off of that, <laughs> as you do become sort of, the characters become more you and you become more the characters, was there any preparation any of you felt the need to do before the pilot or after you got picked up and you knew you were going to be playing this character for, fingers crossed, seven years, um, in terms of like building your character as a person? Well, my character, Jake, was, I'm, I'm six foot one and Jake was written as six foot, so I've been, Here we go. so for like a month I was working on acting an inch shorter. What does that entail specifically? Just kind of just uh, walking around, like just kind of uh, like slouching just a little bit, you know, thinking, like just looking, like changing your eye line a little bit. It's just a lot, it's a, bit, it's a longer process. I can't believe I'm going to ask you this, Ken, yeah. but is Jake with us now? Jake is not with you right now. Jake is not, but, I, Jake, but Jake, can, Jake can come and visit if you guys would like. Yeah, a lot of times Ken has trouble accessing Jake on command, and it's hard because we're yeah. starting to shoot, and he will have to say, Jake's not here. Jake's not here, and then I'll have to, I'll have to kind of step in and do Jake's part, and I think that that's not fair for me. You know. um, is Jake yeah. an actor also? Jake is not an actor, no. no. Jake has a job, but we're not sure what it is because he got fired from the job that he had in the in pilot. A, in a cubicle. In a cubicle of some sort, yeah. yeah. But I mean, if you have real questions for Jake, I'm gonna have to access him oh, and it's don't a, have time. It's a, I don't think we do have time. It's it takes a, a while thing. for Jake to get here. Anyone else besides? Well, it is funny that, that you say that about the job. It is, d details about the characters slide around so much. In this episode, I say I was born in Chicago. And then in an upcoming, upcoming episode, I say I was born in, like, Brussels yeah. <laughs> or something. <laughs> what we're going to find out is you're a compulsive liar. They'll, they'll right. justify it at some point. 
Kay's a neighbor. Originally, Kay was a neighbor, and then that's sort of unclear. I asked David one day, I was like, is she, does she live in the building? Is she a neighbor? He was like, I don't know, maybe. Uh, <laughs> so you can try to do your, you know, preparation as an actor, but you don't know what the fuck's going on. <laughs> yeah, that's about right. I mean, I would, I, I'm, so what I'm hearing is with a comedy, it's sort of more about relying on what's on the page than what is sort of you've come up with yourself as a motivation sometimes. I mean, my preparation is constantly my brain, and I would prefer to have no feedback from the audience as to if this is successful or not. <laughs> but, and I'm just going to look down. <laughs> I try to literally just say, stop being so broad. Don't make it like Penny. Just be grounded. <laughs> it's like yelling, and then I watch it, and I'm like, well... That ship sailed. <laughs> I think that's true. I mean, I, but, but yeah, I think there's like, I feel like you watch a lot of sitcoms and there's almost like, you know, there's sort of a stock. Well, just hold on a second, just so everybody knows. Sitcom is situation, short for situation comedy. <laughs> everybody knows that. Um, there's sort of like a stock broad <laughs> behavior pattern that you can fall into. And I think that is a big part of it uh, that I think about is like, what's the, there's a way to do this line that is like you would see in any sitcom, sort of like the obvious performance of this. And then is there a way to do it that's like different in any way or coming at it from a different angle? And, and I, I, you know, I hope, hope, I think, but you know, I hope everybody thinks this show has, you know, is, is, not stock in its in in the performances and stuff that there are a little you know my character i there's a lot of like times when he says like bro or is like sort of beer swilling and i try to steer away from that cuz i feel like that hmm? No, I was going to say, but I think that that's, it's not just the, your character in this. I think watching you perform and seeing, seeing the work that you've done, you're constantly, <laughs> you're constantly trying, as an actor, as a comedian, you're constantly trying to kind of come up with a fresh new way of, I of, think you would of delivering a line and, 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 you know, kind of exploring a scene and exploring a character. So I don't, think that ha I, don't, I don't necessarily think that that has to do with just this show. I think that that's just how you work as, a, as an actor, and I think that that's what makes you such a funny, fresh, uh, uh, comedian. But here's the Thank thing. Thank you so much. You, Hold on a second. Okay. <laughs> um, Thank you. <laughs> uh, no, that's it. Oh, well. I think you're very funny, too. <laughs> I was going to say, I think you're very funny. Oh, thank you. <laughs> no, you know, I, I was incredibly intimidated to come do the show, and I was for several episodes. I mean, comedy, doing comedy on a show this fast and this well-written is a completely different thing than, uh, than anything else. It just is. And I, and I wasn't coming off of another comedy. Like, you mu it's so, I don't know. These are very, very masterful comedic actors. And... and <laughs> And I and I, I have to say, like it's a different. Well, look, the preparation for doing an episode is so not the same as the prep for a play or the prep for a drama. Sorry. Um, so. Well, I do think with this this writing and the same thing was true of happy endings. You can try all you want to play at low energy, and it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. I find yeah. because it's moving so fast that when you're behind your energy, it, it just doesn't. There's something about it, it. It doesn't work, and so I think the tone kind of dictates, you know broad acting style or whatever it is, I think it just requires energy to me, no matter what the choices are within that. Well, Dan, I'd like to see a little more of that from my co-stars. You're yeah, absolutely, sorry. Sorry, Miss Wilson. I'm uh, Miss Casp, I'm sorry. Thank you. We have to meet your level. <laughs> Dan, when you said, you know, talking about what you're talking about and sort of it's like a whole different beast what you're doing now, I mean, what have been lessons you've learned about doing this kind of comedy or what have been sort of the things that you've hung on to in order to find that groove yeah I, I was very the first couple of episodes i was like oh i'm terrible i am terrible i can't do this i absolutely suck i was so sure i was going to be fired because it didn't no, no it's really just more about like getting into a place where you can trust the words are really funny and it's true like a certain amount of energy and bring your complete self to committing to the words that are on that page because it's like music it really is music if you just if you know, you have to play play the notes that are written on the page, and and I was like, 
trying to trying to get around it and figure out my way and like I, I'm not fu I'm, this isn't funny and by the way sometimes you're giving the layup to the other person who's going to land the, 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 the punchline but it really the lesson I learned was to be patient with myself which is true of every actor on every show should be and in time you sort of learn from your partners and you realize that it's funny it just is funny the, the lesson I've learned is I think with this show I think we can all agree we're, we're we're curing disease. We are changing the landscape. We're of... changing the world. Yeah. We're changing the world. And I think that's how we all feel. <laughs> well, I am curious, you know, sort of in closing, because you do have a room full of actors in front of you. And I mean, working in this industry, I think you get a lot of really good and really bad advice, be it from people who try to control your career or think they know better or other actors. And um, so <laughs> I don't know who you just I looked at knowingly. <laughs> But I am curious, you know, um, whether it's bad advice that you sort of have learned something good from or great advice, what has been a lesson you've learned or something you, that's been imparted to you over your career that you would share with a room of actors? In, in, in just getting acting gigs or like when you're working on something? I'm just... I'm yes. Anything. <laughs> well, I think, I think what Dan was saying is like, you know, like when you look at a scene or when you're working on something with a group of people, you should... I, I, when you said musically, I, I, I look at scenes and think about them musically. What's the music? What's the comedy of the scene? And how, how, does it, how does it flow? And how do I serve the story? What's my part in this scene? And then what's my part in the overall story? And so, you know, a lot of times actors will take their time with everything. And sometimes it's better to kind of look at a scene as a whole and be like, okay, well, this is where I can kind of open up and, you know, think about it musically, kind of have a little run or something. But like throughout it, to, in order to kind of make that moment land, I need to kind of keep everything kind of moving along to, to hit that, you know, spot where I can open it up or something like that. And uh, it's, I ju it's, it's just interesting to hear somebody else talk about a, a, a scene musically because it's, it's, it's how I like to look at uh, stuff. And so if that, means anything to anybody, you know, awesome. there you have it. <laughs> Sarah? I, I could say something about um, auditioning. I think that was, you know, I, I, I wasn't classically trained or I didn't go to acting school. And um, when I first started, I was so terrified going in the room because I was like, I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm just going to have energy and smile a lot and see what happens. And, you know, and, and so the more I did it, the more, the more that I got to know, you know, working on stuff. The more I knew how many people in this town were here and how many people were auditioning, and the longer I was out here, I was like, oh my god, I'm terrified. Like, how am I going to get my next job? And so I actually became friends with um, a casting director, and she gave me such a great piece of advice, which was the people that are in there, they want you to do a good job. They want to see you shine, and they want your best. And so just go in there and, and know that and try to let that release you and free you a little bit and see what happens. And when they told me that, I was like, oh my god, OK. And so I would walk in and look at everyone, and I'd be like, they want me to do good. I'm going to give that a shot. And for some reason, that's and not waiting for did you to not, fail. Not waiting for you to fail, right. exactly. And that helped me let go enough to where I, you know, not hyperventilating every time I walk in. <laughs> John? Um, uh, I think, you know, I came up doing uh, improv where it's, all about the group dynamic you know it's it's not i mean you know it's about you want to be funny as an individual but you know the show lives or dies by the dynamics within the group so i think in doing this you know it's all about finding the dynamic that works with with whoever you're working with i mean finding like getting on that level with them and figuring out what's funny you know like a scene if i do a scene with timberly or if i do a scene with ken it's like we have a different dynamic, but that's something to to find and figure out with each person that you're working with, and that's you know it's it's less about it's less satisfying to watch an individual person be good than it is to watch people having a dynamic together. So that's something that I would say to strive to figure out with every person that you work with. And ingratiate yourself to them, and you know, then you'll be able to manipulate them uh, throughout your career, and that 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 yields a lot of benefits. Yeah. <laughs> it's a political industry. You gotta. Uh, I would say 
be a selfish beast, you know, be a monster. I'm not kidding, not outwardly <laughs> to people, but to yourself. It's what made all the difference for me. Like I used to care a whole lot about what was going on around outside me <laughs> and what people thought about what I was doing. I'm not kidding. When I stopped giving a really big shit about what other people were thinking about what I was doing or what was going on, that's when things started to no, take off. Absolutely, you can't, you have I'm to not gonna, give a shit. I, Just no, you be do true to yourself. Just I'm telling be true the truth. To what I, you I would in. say, okay, I'm brown and all these girls in here are white, women with red hair, I'm fucked. No. Or I would say, oh my God, I'm chubby and every girl in this room is a zero four, I'm fucked. Nothing has anything to do with anything. Y you just have to show up and consistently do well and let your balls drop and be a monster. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I'm so in love with you right now. <laughs> um, I was gonna say that for about 25 years since I was five, um, I've been, t I've, you, you keep hearing, especially in this business, be yourself. I, I didn't know what that means. I, you know, y you get told that all the time and it doesn't really mean anything. I mean, it does. I'm about to say it really does. But you, whatever it takes to find out who you are, it's so important. I realize like the fear, how much time we spend both in getting jobs and at the job, we spend trying to be the kind of person that is gonna act like they know what they're doing even though they're terrified or become the person that you think that you hope that they want you to be. None of that is real. None of that's authentic. All of that is pretend. And until you're able to be on the set and look at the line and not know what it means and not be afraid to go to the director or the writer or one of your actors and not be afraid to say, I don't even know what this joke means and I have to say it. <laughs> Will you either say it for me or tell me what it means or, and not be afraid that that then means about you, you're a loser, you're horrible, you're terrible. And those kinds of things all have to do with being yourself. If you're genuinely afraid, don't be afraid to say it. And if you, it's kind of it, part and parcel to like not really caring what other people think. Once you know who you are, you can be yourself. And I, I think it took, it took me 25 years, but however long it takes, it's the most important thing, I think. Casey? I think sort of along with that, and this might be a little kooky, my advice is really like, if you are struggling with any issues, like go to therapy, like get your shit figured out because nobody wants to hear it, I feel like. <laughs> Like when you walk into an audition, it's, it's, you're carrying that negative energy and I know this is kooky, but I do really feel like if you work your stuff out, like I have done so much better just kind of like dealing with things and that, that might have nothing to do with the business, but I feel like if you're coming in like, I'm so fearful and I'm, I have no confidence, it just, it reads, I really feel. And if you're coming in just kind of at peace and <laughs> like a monster, then <laughs> I really Happen think yeah, people, yeah. it kind of begets work and begets energy, and I know that's really kooky, um, but that's what I think. And oh, the last, this one casting director told me, which has been so true, she's like, when you're done auditioning, get the fuck out of the room. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, stop trying to chat, don't do a bit, get the fuck out. And I audition people, and I, and I now, like, I'm like, thank you, bye, I, like, run out. Uh, but I think it's true, it's like, do it and get gone. I love it. Well. Thank you to these monsters who are here with us today, the cast of Marry Me. Uh, thank you all so much for coming. Thank you guys out for coming. Sack Foundation, and have a lovely Saturday. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.